Hello and welcome to the third session of our workshop series Application of CFD in Formal Student and Formula SAE. Uh, my name is Milad and again it's a big pleasure to welcome you to our today's session. Uh, I've introduced me the last two times so I don't want to talk too much today about myself or the company or uh, the organization of this workshop. Uh, if this is the first session that you're watching, I will, would uh, highly recommend you to take a look on our YouTube uh, page uh, and uh, to watch the previous sessions of the webinar. And let's directly start to talk about today's agenda. And today we have a very special guest, uh, Torbjörn Larsson, and uh, he will share some of his insights with you which he's gained uh, in his long career as a head of CFD at uh, Zauber F1, BMW Zauber F1 and Ferrari F1. And um, before I hand over to Torbjörn, I would like to quickly mention some organizational things. So as I mentioned, this is the third session and you can uh, watch the recording from the previous sessions uh, on our website and on YouTube. Um, and in contrast to the last two years, this time the homework assignment won't be a simulation assignment, but a quiz. And we'll send you the quiz by email uh, after the last session next week. And as I mentioned today, Torbjörn Larsson will talk about uh, CFD-based development strategies. Next week we'll have our final session where Niklas Feifel will join. He is uh, head of aerodynamics at the Ecolo Motorsport team. And he will share some of their best practices with you, how they use SimScale uh, for their aerodynamic development. Yeah, finally, uh, uh, I cannot mention it enough. Uh, you can join our um, SimScale Academic program and become a sponsored tree. And this means that you will get free access to, to the commercial SimScale plans, as well as access to exclusive tools, webinars and training, as well as a premium support via chat. And if you're interested, you just need to um, download the application form, fill it out, send it by email to us, and then your account will get activated. Yes, and now it's a big pleasure for me to hand over uh, to Torbjörn. Um, as I mentioned, um, and probably most of you know, uh, Torbjörn um, is, is what I would call the F1 CFD veteran. So he built up different CFD departments um, at Sauber F1, and he also led the CFD department um, at uh, the later BMW F1 team at Ferrari. And today he's working uh, as a, a consultant for CFD. And yes, I'm very happy that he joined for the third time. And uh, I will make him now the presenter. Okay. Thanks a lot, Mina, for the introduction. I hope everyone can hear me now. Yes. Uh, okay, I will start. So, so um, yeah, I, I, I hopefully should be able to give you some kind of idea how you go about to work with, with these tools you're going to use by SimScale in, in terms of doing CFD analysis and, and developing uh, some kind of race cars, possibly. So initially, I wish to give you some kind of idea about what is an aero development strategy, uh, what to think about uh, in, in terms of, of development uh, and what kind of conditions to develop towards. Um, that would also quite quickly then bring me into uh, speak a bit more about the, the actual CFD methodology and what kind of modeling strategies you should be thinking of, um, what are the limitations in the kind of tools you're using, how do you prepare your models in terms of CAD, grid generation, setting up flow conditions and so on. Th uh, important stuff to think about, a little bit of a kind of a best practice, um, obviously won't be able to go in, in great details in this, but hopefully um, get you started to think about um, some concepts. 
Uh, and then maybe most importantly, after you've done your, your, your first simulations in your analysis, um, what should you be looking for in terms of the results? Are they feasible? Um, are they accurate enough? Uh, what are the important things to look after in terms of uh, flow quality, quality in your results, uh, the flow physics and so on? I will get into that as well. Um, so first of all, just to give you kind of an idea about aero development strategies, um, uh, I introduced this concept of what we call aero mapping. And basically what that is, is that when you try to develop a race car, you have to, to, to consider the car at, at the various, say, racing conditions. Uh, so you have to evaluate your car in, in at different uh, uh, conditions or operating points and that could be maybe uh, on a long straight uh, maybe you're aiming for very high top speed or possibly you're looking into some um, corner entry conditions or where you're hard on the brake the car is pitching or maybe turning the car is rolling um, all those things are, are important might be important aspects and at the end of the day when you develop the car, you have to try to figure out what are these operating points and what what, what are really important ones and how should you weight them. Uh, so, so so maybe you come up with a number, as I have on the screen here, something I call CZ merit. So you can think of this as being your ultimate done force average over a, a, a number of conditions and, and you weight them differently. Maybe you, you think that uh, lower drag on a straight is less important than, than uh, a lot of downforce in the corner. So, so you make different choices and, and compromises. Uh, and this, obviously, this kind of merit function you're trying to optimize for will be different depending on what kind of condition you, you're putting into this. And here is an example I give you to the left, the layout of, of the track in, in Suzuka, Japan, or to the right, we see the, the track in Barcelona. The, the, they have quite different characteristics, and, and, and um, whether you optimize the car for one track or the, or the, or the other, uh, end of the day, you might end up with two different vehicles. Uh, so, so this kind of whole idea with, with air mapping is really to make you think about what are the conditions I need to optimize for. Uh, and, and it won't be, quite typically, it won't be one single condition. So it's a combination of things. So that's that's kind of the, 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 the prime message I, I would like to give you here. Um, here's just an example, so some very old stuff, uh, very simplistic kind of Formula One race car where we see, uh, where, where we try to change the ride height condition uh, of, the, of the CFD model through, through something we call mesh morphing. So we have an initial baseline mesh and then basically deforming the mesh uh, so, so we put the car at different ride eyes, ride eyes. and this could be the, the new way to simulate, uh, say, the braking maneuver, the cornering maneuver, the car is, is, is heaving or, or pitching or rolling and so on. Uh, and the nice thing with this kind of technology using mesh morphing is that you don't have to remesh your model every time. You can, within limits, you, you can, you can uh, stretch or squeeze your mesh without compromising the quality too much. Um, this is an example to kind of illustrate that. So let me move on then to, to, to more into strategies and methodology when it comes to, to CFD modeling. Uh, try just to give you some kind of simple recommendations where to start really. As I said before, in terms of air development strategies, think about what is what are the most important driving conditions you need to analyze and, and develop your, your car towards? So if you look at, say, Formula student cars, as an example, uh, they are traveling at relatively low speed, which means that the side wind influences will be quite, quite significant. So it's probably a very good idea to develop the car runs around some kind of side wind condition because you can think Statistically, you would certainly have side winds on average. Uh, so, so whether you develop the car for, for a straight ahead wind condition or maybe a 10 degree uh, yaw condition, you may end of the day end up with different designs. So, so maybe you should wait 
the sideways conditions higher than the straight ahead conditions, as an example. Uh, and that could also mean that, that you should not really design your vehicle for ultimate peak performance at one single condition. Uh, it would you would probably end up with a more robust design if 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 you if you average over a couple of conditions, and that probably end of the day will give you a, a better drivability and better handling. So so so, so think of that. Just just looking at the ultimate downforce at a given condition might not be what you necessarily want to do. Uh, the other thing to keep in mind because. Uh, most of the stuff you're going to do in CFD is probably going to be steady-state simulation because running transient flows will, will be quite expensive, takes a lot of time. Uh, however, the reality is, is never steady-state completely. Uh, there will always be some kind of unsteadiness in, in the flow, and here we're trying to compute some, some kind of average conditions. Uh, and that is something that you should keep in mind because uh, some of the structure that, that we are looking at uh, in, in the flow field around the car, uh, they are then averaged, say, like in time average conditions. And could be that those structures don't really exist in reality. Uh, they are kind of a result of, a, of, of an average condition. So, uh, so that is something that you always should consider when, when you look at data. Uh, and then, of course, use common sense. Uh, I, I often see that people are making small tweaks uh, in their design, and, and they see some significant changes in, 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 in their predictions. Um, right or wrong, um, could be, but uh, my recommendation to you would be that if you're making a very minor, minute uh, geometry change, do not expect to see significant or huge changes in your results because if you do that uh, cautious um, there might be something going on that you don't uh, didn't expect uh, so again that's a bit of a common sense approach to take to be a bit cautious when you evaluate your results uh, so if, if we think about the process of doing CFD we, we can line it up something like this, going from left to right. We, we typically start with some, some CAD description of our, our geometry. From the continuous CAD, we have to make this discrete kind of mesh representation that the, the flow solver can compute on. Then we do the actual solving phase. And then towards the end, we do the interesting stuff. We try to analyze the data and draw some conclusions from what we've done. So let me go into these various building blocks a little bit in, in, in detail. So if you start with CAD, uh, which actually is a very, very important um, part, uh, part in this process. And I, I cannot state enough the importance of we to spend sufficient time on CAD preparation. Because if you don't do that, it will bite you in the end. You have to come back to your CAD, redo stuff. So, so take sufficient time to make sure you have a good starting model. Try to make it clean and as simple as, as, as possible. Remove um, features not that doesn't have to be there. If, if you have bad quality or you have gaps or leakages in your CAD, that can always create an issue. So, so take some time on that. Uh, and also try to resolve the geometry properly, uh, what I mean by properly. Because if you don't do that, no matter how fine the mesh you do in the end afterwards, it, it wouldn't help you because you have to resolve the geometry in the first place to, 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 to capture uh, the curvature of wings. And so. so make sure when, when you export your CAD, look, look at the CAD surfaces like in, in, in shaded mode. Uh, uh, with lights on and so on, so you can see that the the, the leading edge of wings are nice and smooth and not faceted uh, because that cannot be fixed afterwards. Then you have to go back. Try to remove small features if they are not, if you don't think they are very important to the results, because at the end of the day, if, if if they have the small features in there, you probably would need to resolve them in the mesh. They can cost a lot of mesh and a lot of cells. Because if you don't resolve them, you might end up with very bad quality mesh. 
uh, and that will compromise the results. So, so quite often you are better off to remove them. Another important thing is, and this is with, with uh, very narrow angles, acute angles, and I will give you uh, in, in a minute an example of how the, the tire meets the ground, that can be an issue. So, but in principle, everywhere where you have uh, surfaces meeting at, at a very small angle, basically they are almost parallel, that could be an issue uh, because you have to make a discrete model of your CAD, you have to make a mesh. So somehow you have to put in elements, triangles or tetrahedrons uh, in this narrow gap with, with, between surfaces. And that can be very difficult without spending a lot of cells or ending up with cells of bad quality. So it's quite often better than to slightly compromise the geometry, possibly putting in a radius or something instead of having this very sharp edge meeting. Put in a small radius so you can squeeze in some cells some grid cells in there with, with better quality. There is also some considerations you have to do up front when you're preparing your model. Um, here's an example of, of a kind of a simplistic F1 front wing. And this is a very clean and nice CAD that has been worked on, on, on a lot and you wouldn't find any, any gaps in the CAD surfaces. There are no overlaps and so on and everything is resolved quite properly. Uh, not so much more to say about that, but this is kind of, this is a good starting CAD, uh, nicely cleaned. Um, there's not a lot of small tiny patches and that is also another kind of good practice if you can uh, reduce the number of CAD surfaces, the number of patches is, is typically much better for your meshing software and in the end if you can combine small patches into bigger ones. Uh, keeping the quality and so on, that would quite often help. Um, this is not a front wing example, but this is getting back to now in this example where we have surfaces meeting at a very narrow angle. Uh, we have always some difficulties to, to define the shape of tires. No one really knows how the tire looks uh, very close to the ground. Uh, and obviously this depends on, on your condition, how how much you are loading the tire, uh, what kind of footprint you create. But, but one thing for sure we do know that the, 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 the tire is, is kind of very flat uh, to, towards the ground where, where they meet. They meet at a very, very acute angle. And, and this can be an issue if you try to mesh it uh, in, in this reading here what we highlight with the circle. So what, what do you do? Well, good practice here is actually to try to sort of compromise the action geometry. And uh, we, are, we are putting in some kind of a geometrical plinth here where the tire meets the ground. And, and sorry, I'll just go back. The reason we're doing this is just that to be able to put in uh, your, your, your grid, your volume grid in between the ground and the tire and here in, in this region still get good quality cells. That is actually a better practice than try to squeeze in cells uh, where the tire meets uh, almost flat to the ground. So, so this plane could be maybe a few millimeters high or something on that order, um, just to ensure that you get, you get a, a good quality. And this is just one example of kind of decisions you take up front when you build your model. Think of the, 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 the end results, the quality of your mesh and the quality of your simulations. So, so if we then, we, we leave the CAD, we have a, our starting CAD, we are very happy with that. Now we should look at how we make a discrete model, how we make a computation. Uh, we, we need to build a surface mesh and a volume mesh around our, our object in a sufficiently large domain. So, so the first thing we have to, to think to ourselves is that what kind of say, cell budget do I have? Because the more cells you put in, the longer it will take to, to compute, uh, the more uh, expensive it will be in, in, in time and so on. So there will be a constraint. How, how, what, what can you afford? When do you need your results? How many cells can you put in? What kind of computer do you have and so on? Uh, so this is an important consideration. Obviously coupled to that is the kind of, uh, accuracy you, you expect to get from your simulations. 
what are the scales that I need to, to resolve? And now I'm talking about scales. There could be the could be scales in time if we are going to resolve flow in time. Typically, you, you probably won't do that in, in these kind of projects. So you typically trying to run steady state. But what kind of scales in space do you need to resolve? Are we expecting some some small scale structures that we think that would be important? Where do we think that we propagate? Uh, what does it mean in terms of mesh? How many cells do I need to to to, to resolve a vortex properly and things like that? Uh, I probably cannot have that kind of cell resolution everywhere in 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 my domain. So I have to have an idea of where the, the flow, will, the important flow feature, will propagate and, and maybe put the cells in, in those regions. So having kind of a strategic cell allocation, probably things uh, near surfaces are more important than far away from the car, where we have strong gradients and so on. Maybe in, actually quite often what happens behind the car is quite important, what we call the wake behind the car. We get a lot of viscous losses propagating downstream forming a large peak behind the car uh, and it's quite important actually if you want to get good predictions of forces in drag and downforce then you actually have to resolve the region behind the car behind the car uh, to, to, to a great extent and then obviously what, what do you do in the far field how, how, how big will your domain be and so on uh, another thing as I said you, you cannot afford to have a very fine mesh everywhere so you have to have a kind of a distribution to larger cells if possible you should do that in a smooth way to try to avoid large jump, jumps in cell size at least in regions where we have strong flow gradients because that is going to hit your 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 simulation accuracy uh, another thing uh, that could be worth to think about is that there might be some feature edges of your model that are important uh, for, for the flow. And, 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 and um, so there are ways to preserve feature edges. Probably you don't want to preserve every feature edge on, on your model, but there, maybe there are some more important than other ones. Um, and, and that could mean that, it, that very localized, you, you have to have a very fine mesh, mesh resolution. Uh, so it, again, we take this front wing, what we see is the portion of, of our front wing uh, surface mesh in the pictures. Uh, so the, a couple of things we can observe here now. First of all, if we look around the leading edge of the front wing, we see that we have much smaller triangles here. And that's because that we, we, we would like to properly resolve the curvature of the wing. The flow will accelerate around the leading edge, uh, creating suction and so on, and, and over speeds. So it's important that we have a good resolution there. You can also see that the, 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 the cell elements are gradually becoming larger on the top surface of the wing, where typically not much is happening. But they are, they are sort of um, getting a bit larger in a smooth way. There are no big jumps in cell size. Uh, the other thing you can, you can see that on the, on, the, on the lower surface of the wing, which is Typically, the side of the wing that creates downforce, where you get low pressure, we have a, a finer mesh. So we have a higher resolution on the suction side. And towards the, the, the trailing edge, we have a thin trailing edge. Um, but here, we, we, we would like to preserve the sharp trailing edge where the, the flow leaves the surface. So that is kind of one of those feature edges I was talking about that we want to preserve in, in our model. And then if we slice through the wing in a vertical plane, just to illustrate, this is showing in a small region of, of your volume mesh or, or your near surface mesh. So, so here we have special kind of elements close to the wing surface and we're putting in this we call prism layers. So they're kind of a very structure and, and they gradually expand in size as you move out from the surface normally. And, and this is a way that we have a very well controlled mesh quality and mesh distribution in the region close to, to the surface where we had the viscous boundary layer growing. And, and we can see in this picture here, which has been colored by, I believe, total pressure, 
where we see this kind of yellowing yellow region here, which kind of represents the, the growing uh, boundary layer close to the surface. Uh, and, and ideally, we would like to have this boundary layer within those prism layer cells. So we have a very good control of, of the mesh uh, quality and, and, and so on in, in the near world region. Uh, so that was a few things about the CAD and the mesh. Uh, I'm moving quite quickly here now, but uh, just want to say a few words about the, of, of the setup and the, and the solver. Um, I think the, the kind of procedures you get for same scale are, are, are some kind of best practices uh, developed for these kind of applications, and that's probably some very good starting point. But still, I would like to give you some kind of background and ideas to, to certain things to, to, to consider. Uh, one thing obviously is your simulation domain. You have to have a finite domain around your, your vehicle where you can impose uh, under conditions. And, and, and you have to make the domain sufficiently large so that you can make sure that you, you can really impose free sim conditions at the boundaries. So basically the meaning that the boundaries should not feel the effect of the car. So then you can you can impose uniform inland condition and so on. And also if the domain is too small, you get some kind of what we call solid blockage. You get a blockage effect from, from, the, from the simulation domain, meaning that you get not the correct representation of, of, the, of the airflow around the car and you will get sort of an offset in any in in force predictions and so on. Uh, there are other things you need to consider, but I think that would be taken care of typically in, in, in your setup here. It's like, Typically, you have the ground plane moving, uh, same speed as, as, as the rotating wheels. So you have rotating wheels. Maybe have things like uh, porous media to, to, to simulate the, effect, the restriction effect you have from, say, radiators and so on, heat exchangers. Quite important because they will affect the, the, the blockage in, in, through the car and, and so on. Um, and then we have this whole thing about turbulence models. Um, there are certain things that we cannot um, solve for uh, and we need to model somehow and typically solving these navi stokes equations for pressure and velocity and continuity and so on. Um, there are some unknowns in terms of turbulence that, and those need to be models with some, some models. Quite often uh, those models are kind of linked to, to the kind of problem you try to solve. And depending on what kind of mesh you have, what kind of grid resolution you have, and what kind of wall boundary conditions you, you have, some models are better suited than others. And that is something to consider as well. So uh, whatever turbulence model you're choosing, make sure it's kind of a proper model for that kind of mesh you have, the kind of resolution you have. Um, another recommendation would also be to, to always to try to run with second order numerical schemes uh, to, to, to get as, as, as good predictions as possible. But that is kind of, say, standard procedure today. Uh, I, I would uh, most solvers to, to always run a second order mode. Another very important thing that people sometimes tend to forget, they are so happy when they get, when they get the simulations done and, and eager to look at the results. Uh, and things might look very, very realistic and reasonable, but it's, it's a very good practice to always look at, at your convergence history. Um, typically, the flow solvers give you an idea from each of the iteration, uh, the error in your solution, what I call the flow residuals. And, and they, should, should, they should, should converge to some very small numbers. And it's always a good practice to plot that, plot your residual versus iteration to see that they should be sort of uh, monotonically redu be re being reduced. It, because if they start to increase, uh, that's an indication that something is not quite right in the flow field. Uh, so you should the flow residuals, uh, like in, in, in terms of pressure residuals and, and residuals in velocity and, and maybe also your turbulent quantities. But then you should also monitor your forces. Uh, if, if you log your force and say the total force of the car, maybe the force on the front thing by itself and the force on the rear wing, you see when they start to level off and they should not fluctuate too much, then you have a good indications how well uh, converged your solutions are. Because if you see they are still drifting, changing in, 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 in magnitude levels, 
you probably have to run for, for a bit longer, otherwise maybe you, you end up drawing the wrong conclusion for your simulation because the flow field has not converged fully. Okay, so once we've done then the, the, our simulation, we would like to look at the results, uh, try to learn something, draw conclusions, just to give you some kind of general idea. Again, the first thing I, I, I always look at when I, when I look at my results is try to check uh, my boundary conditions. Does this look reasonable? Uh, even look at, at, at your, your, your far field um, velocity distribution, pressure distributions. Do I have any disturbances coming from my, my boundaries or any reflections? Maybe I imposed the wrong conditions somewhere. Things like that can easily be missed if you just zoom into the car, you think everything looks okay. But if you, if you zoom out again, maybe there's something going on in, in the far field. So as a good practice, always give a first a good overview, make a few slices through your domain. Does it look sensible? Do I have the expected inlet conditions? Do I have the expected outlet pressure? Um, and then Look at, at your boundary, look at the flow close to the surface. Um, does the flow look? Is it healthy? Is the flow mainly attached or do I see some big separations where the flow is leaving the surface? Would I ex expect that? Is it due to a bad design? Is it due to some numerical errors? Have I under-resolved my, 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 my domain? Look in areas where you have strong pressure gradients. Uh, and then look off surface flow, look in the wake, as I said, behind the car is also in, in, important. If, if I move uh, from, um, if I'm slicing through the car from the front to the back, if I see some very strong structures propagating from the, say, from the front wing, are they still there uh, midway through the car or, or have they dissipated away? Could that mean then that my mesh is too coarse possibly? Things like that. Uh, and when you plot things, and when you compare different things, try to be very consistent in, in your colors, color scales and ranges, uh, because um, as you know, the devil is kind of in the details. So, so if you're comparing uh, two plots from two different designs, and if the scales are not exactly the same, um, it's easy to fool yourself. Uh, and, and if possible, compute delta plots to highlight differences. So if you can su subtract solution from one case uh, versus another, so you see the, the actual difference. Because sometimes the differences are quite subtle to, to, to see in a color plot. If we can use delta plots, they become very much more obvious. I'll be showing an example of, of that uh, shortly. Um, this might be, be sound a bit trivial, and it's probably very trivial for some 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 of you. But uh, I think it's important to to understand the difference between static and total pressure, uh, because these are the quantities that we use a lot for for, for uh, data analysis and and, and 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 evaluation our results. And static pressure are good for some things; uh, total pressure are, are better for other things. Uh, so I will explain you the difference. And then we definition of what we call the pressure coefficients. So first of all, if, if we look at, at a race car like that, we see that the yellow uh, rectangles here where I have marked where they have what is called the pitot pressure probes that are used to, to, to measure the speed. And quite often you see them on, on airplanes. And what is the pitot pressure probe? Well, it's basically a tube like that uh, oriented towards the, 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 the free stream or the, the tra traveling direction. And with the pitot, pitot probe, you can measure both static and total pressure. And, and what you measure here in, in the center, in, in the white channel here, that would be the total pressure. So basically, you, you're bringing the air to rest from free stream condition down to rest here at the bottom of the chamber. This is the total pressure. On the side of the pitot tube on the wall, that will be the static pressure in the yellow path. Uh, and, and basically, if, if we were to look at the Bernoulli's equation along the stream, and that was, that would say that the total pressure equals the static pressure plus dynamic pressure. 
So the difference now between total pressure and static pressure is actually this term, the dynamic pressure, which is one half rho v squared, where rho is the uh, density of the air and v is, is the velocity of, the, of your vehicle. So this is the dynamic pressure, and that, that is an important quantity. It, you, you can think about it like well, being the kinetic energy of your moving air. And we use this dynamic pressure to, to derive the, the, the non-dimensionalized coefficient, the pressure coefficient CP, or the total pre pressure coefficient CPT. So basically what we do then is that we from the static pressure, the, 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 the atmospheric pressure that you can measure, we subtract the reference pressure, like normal atmospheric conditions, and then we normalize this with the dynamic pressure. Because then we get the coefficient that is independent of, of your traveling speed, so you can, pair, you can compare results from simulations done at one velocity versus another one. Otherwise, it will be very, very difficult if you look in, different, in absolute numbers. And we do the same with the total pressure. So we, we create a total pressure coefficient. So what does that mean now? Just to give you an idea here, we have a race car, and we have a, again, thinking about Bernoulli, we have a streamline starting far away from the car, approaching the car, maybe hitting the nose here, uh, where we have stagnation, and, and, and move away. So in, in the far field, we would have a, a CP coefficient of zero. And we have, we have a CPT coefficient, total pressure of one. This is our undisturbed free stream condition. In the stagnation region, where, where we basically bring in the, the air to, to, to rest, CP and CPT would be the same. They would be one, or stagnation pressure. So we have a very well-defined range of, of pressure coefficient to look at. So then if we, if, if we look at a plot like this, here we are rendering the surfaces of the car with, with CP, like the static pressure coefficient. But these directions we see here, the off-surface direction, this is actually the, the front wheel weight we see here. That, that would not be very visible or very obvious uh, if we were to render it with, with CP. So we'd rather render it with, with the CPT, with the total pressure coefficient, because that includes that, that term, the one, half rho v square, which is the kinetic energy. And, and basically what happens in, in those wake regions, we have a lot of viscous losses. So we're losing total pressures. And it becomes very visible when we render it with total pressure. So then if, if, we, if we were to integrate the CP coefficient on the surface of the car, we will end up with our force coefficient in terms of downforce or, or drag. And the total pressure, pressure coefficient is, as I said, very good to visualize the, the flow structures off the surface. We see where we have strong uh, structures traveling or where we have losses in, you know, when, so that could be losses due to the tire weights, but it can also be very strong structures created by, by, by say, the front wing deflectors creating strong vortices that we might want to use to our advantage to, 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 to steer the flow in, the, in a certain direction, for instance. Uh, so, so then, just to continue then with, with, the, with the coefficients, as we have for, for pressure, we have those coefficients for, for the integrated forces. We would have like Cx for drag. So we have the, the, the drag force in x duration uh, measured in newtons. And then we have Q, which again is, is the, 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 the dynamic pressure, one half rho v squared. And then we have some kind of reference area which typically is the frontal area of the car. Again, in this way, we can compare forces between simulations done at various speeds without a problem. So what should we be looking at? There's a lot of things you can look at from a CFD simulation. We have the obvious thing that looking at the surface, we would look at surface pressure, static pressure, obviously. But also we would look at friction because we have also friction drag, uh, viscous forces that comes from, from, from uh, shear stress. Uh, and, and the friction is quite also good because it gives you kind of an idea of how the flow topology close to the surface might look. So, so if you look here on the picture up to the right, 
we, we are rendering this with, with friction and we have this say this kind of blue streaks here under the floor of the car uh, and that could possibly be an indication that here there are some strong uh, flow structures traveling probably a vortex propagating in un under the floor and get sucked into the diffuser here other obvious things we can look at our streamlines only where, where we see particles and see where they go in the flow field or we can create some kind of isot contours of, of uh, say a total pressure isot total pressure, pressure of zero this is a very nice way to illustrate for instance your tire wakes so, so again if we not if we start to, to, to compare our design so here we have the same car at two different um, conditions so the, the one to the left is where we have a straight ahead wind so we have no side wind component uh, and to the right we have a three degree side wind component and now we're looking at the CP coefficient on the surface so we have a range here between one and minus one so one is a stagnation as I said so the red means where, where, the, uh, where the flow is decelerating like at, at the nose of the car in the front of the tires uh, we have stagnation flow basically and, and a negative number would mean uh, pressure so, so typically if you look underneath the car we see that the front wing is very blue meaning we have low pressure on the front wing suction creates downforce the same here we see on the floor in, in particular at the front of the floor within, within the diffuse so we see low pressure creating suction but but looking at these pictures it's quite hard to distinguish the differences between straight ahead conditions and side wind and, and here it's, where it's quite nice to do these delta plots, as I said before, if we can do the difference between the solutions. And then we can exaggerate the scale. So, so now we have a range from plus 20, 0.25 to minus 0.25 in CP. And now we start to see, so gray is basically where we have no difference. And then we start to see where we have the, 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 the most significant difference in the, in the flow conditions. And then quite often what, what we will see is that due to the side wing component that, that the tire wakes will be different. So we see that in the tires uh, under the floor we have some of this. And this is quite obviously very important because typically the floor is the part of the car that generates most downforce. So we have to, to have a very good control of what's happening uh, with the airflow un underneath the car when we get into side winds, when we corner it and so on. Uh, why are we losing downforce during corner? You know, probably because the floor is not working to 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 100%. Or so maybe there's something happening in the diffuser on one side. We can see here, for instance, so the asymmetry we see in the diffuser. Uh, here's the same thing. Uh, we, we're looking at total pressure. We can we can look uh, through the flow field. And if I click here, you can see if this works. It should be kind of an animation. So we can see how we can we can move this plane uh, vertically through the car to get some kind of appreciation to, to the total pressure losses. Move it again here. So as I said, the red is where you have uh, undisturbed or you have full energy flow, total pressure one, and and uh, blue is, is where you have big losses. And again, we can we can look at the delta where we exaggerate this. So this is a, the difference between straight ahead wind and three degrees of side, side wind. And, and we're highlighting the differences. The, the red and the blue areas is where the flow field differs. And, and as you would expect, you can see that there's a lot of difference due to the, the, tire, the front tire wakes. But also the, the region here, let me run through once more possibly. There are some structures here, and, and this structure we saw that, that they, are, they are the vortices propagating from the front wing. So, so they would be in slightly different positions due to the side wind, and that would, would, would show up in the delta plots. Another very, very, very still kind of simple way to analyze data but still to me one of the absolutely best things is just to slice through your domain in cut planes uh, so, so horizontal and vertical cut planes like x y z planes plotting total pressure is, is very good you can look for static pressure you can look for velocity other things as well but, but quite often if you want to 
identify flow structures of the surface, total pressure is exactly very good. In, in this picture here, you see the effects around the tires. You have big losses. You see those green blobs here, which are probably a vortices traveling off downstream, uh, propagating from the front wing. So we can do many of these slices and run through them and, and animate them back and forth as we as we move along. Uh, these are very very useful illustrative to to understand what's going on in in, in the flow field around the car. You can also see that when you think about a picture like this, as I said before, it's quite important to resolve behind the car. If if you, if you look at this wake behind the car, if you were to integrate that, it's really that what creates your 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 drag. So if you want to predict drag um, correctly, you need to resolve the region behind the car as well. Uh, so just to round off then, uh, if you were to, 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 to develop things on, on Formula Student cars, uh, you will typically get plots like that, like this. So this is again CP, uh, surface pressure. Uh, we have a scale here from minus two to one to one, as I said before, red stagnation. You have stagnation here at the front. If you look underneath, you, you get these deep blue areas. A lot of suction on the front wing and also a lot of suction on the rear wing. These are huge wings, create a lot of downforce. Um, surface pressure is excellent to look at for, for these kind of things. But then again, when you start to, to, to analyze the flow field around the car, you move to total pressure, CPT. CPT01, red here, uh, full energy flow, no losses. Then you see regions like this, the blue regions. Uh, or, or yellow region. So this is typically, there could be losses, there could be viscous losses because of your boundary layer, uh, there could be separations going on, but it can also be that you, you're on purpose creating a flow structure, maybe a vortex, you get a strong vortex uh, with, a lot of, with low total pressure inside, and, and it's uh, with, with this kind of uh, CPT planes, you can try to follow it downstream. To the right here, we see the front wheel wakes. Um, big losses, then they really don't do no good. So, so typically what, what happens like on the front of the car, we have these tire wakes propagating downstream. That's why you have these complex front wings with, with the, uh, millions different deflectors trying to, to create vortices and, and to divert the, the tire wakes outboard so you don't drag them in underneath the, 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 the floor of the car. You want to get them away from the bodywork. And that's why typically you have those very complex uh, front wings. Slicing uh, in the other direction, we see a cut through the, through the rear wing here, for instance. Uh, it's important then to, when you develop things that you try, you, you should make sure that you have a good flow conditions coming into the rear wing. You don't want the rear wing to sit sit in the wake of, of the car. So you you want you need a lot of energy uh, to feed the rear wing. We, we can here we can see on the right picture probably some this rear wing is probably separate. Uh, it looks like the flow is leaving the, the surface here. You have this blue radiance, so this is probably not uh, ideal. It could be reworked. So this wing is possibly not working as it should. A few ideas. Um, I think possibly this was the last slide on my behalf. Yes. Now we are moving to the Q&A and I think I give the scene back to Milad. Fabian, thank you very much for this nice insight. Uh, again, it was a pleasure to follow you. And uh, we already have some questions. And in the case you have a question which you have not submitted in the meantime, it's your like last chance to get in touch directly with Turbion. And we will start with the first question by Aditya. And he wants to know what sort of turbulence models do F1 teams typically use? Do they use runs models at all? Was the question related to Formula 1 teams? I didn't hear yeah. that first part. But yeah. Do you have one okay. team? Uh, well, I'm, I'm, first of all, I have to say I'm not working with the Formula 1 teams uh, anymore. So you have to tell what I say with a pinch of salt. Uh, things might have changed, but uh, still, you know, they have these kind of restrictions uh, in the regulations. They are not allowed to do um, unlimited CFD. 
they have a cap on the number of teraflops they can consume. Uh, and that means that they have to be very careful uh, with their simulations, uh, even though they might would like to do very highly resolved transient simulations, LES or whatever, but that will consume a lot of teraflops. And that means that they cannot do so many design iterations possibly. So end of the day, I think they're still relying a lot on steady RAMs because they are cheap, they are reasonably accurate, they have a very good, say, procedures that they have long experience from developing the cars, so they can get, they can turn around the models very quickly, and, and they can do hundreds of runs in a week. You, but you cannot do hundreds of transient simulations in a week because you're limited. So yes, uh, I, I would be pretty sure they still do a lot of steady runs, but they also do more advanced simulations from time to time to, to, to correlate with what they're doing, yes. Yes, Constantine asks, how can we create the DCP plot and maybe here I can jump in because we've created a script which will automatically calculate the DCP plots from open foam results and SimScale results and if you register for the SimScale free sponsorship you will also receive the script but maybe Turbin also has another idea uh, how you can do it. No, that was excellent yes yeah, sounds like a good uh, good plan. <laughs> Yeah, but that's the only op option you have to calculate the field manually in, in, in a post-processor or to use a script. Yeah. It seems that we have a lot of F1 f uh, fans today here. So Paros <laughs> wants to know how much time is it generally take for mesh generation and solving in F1? Mm. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I guess it, it, it's difficult to get, to get an accurate figure on that. But but what, what I can say though, I mean they, they are they are most teams are really advanced users of CFD and they have very good procedures that they have developed, you know, for, for, for years. And and you know they are in a way in a quite good positions because they do more or less the same thing. Don't get, get me wrong here, but the the, the topology of, of, of the cars are, are more or less the same. So, so they, when they develop procedures, they can, uh, with time, be very, very efficient. So, end of the day, they don't spend much time on, say, manual things. The lot, most of the stuff are automated, scripted. Uh, you get proper CAD and, and the rest of it, like an automated process. So, because you don't want to spend a lot of man time doing uh, mesh preparation, because man time is expensive. But whether it takes half an hour or, 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 or one hour, I cannot really say, but at the end of the day, that's not so important. Uh, the important thing is that you, you don't occupy your engineers with doing manual uh, manual work and manual, manual preparation of meshes. So, so they have very efficient processes and they have very good resources. So, so, so they, they, they are in any way in a lucky situation. <laughs> Okay, and next question is by Daniel. He wants to know, uh, is it important to focus on reducing vortices in order to increase the efficiency of downstream elements? Uh, it, 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 it depends. I mean, like, like in Formula One, you, you try quite often, you would like to create vortices because you want to have uh, make them work for you to, to your advantage. You, you can make vortices, you know, uh, steer some, some flow or in, in a certain directions, like I said before, to uh, divert tire wakes. That is a positive thing. Uh, there could also be that there could be vortices can, can produce low pressures in certain regions where you want them. So, so there they, they can be a benefit of having vortices. But uh, having said that, uh, you should also, you, you must realize that they, they come with losses. They take energy out of, of, of the air, so, so they they produce losses. So there is not a given that you want to have them. So so it, it depends. You have to be uh, kind of creative to, to know uh, when they're good, when they work for you, and when when you you don't want to have them there, right? Very vague answer, I know, but. <laughs> Yeah, that's also something I'm interested very much in, honestly, because I'm waiting for the for the first formula student teams, which start to really leverage these water structures. And uh, I can't tell you too much, but I know that some of the teams uh, working with us, they are uh, working on on such concepts. So uh, okay, yeah. But let's yeah. see. It's it will be very interesting. 
Yes. All right. So I think uh, most of the other questions were already answered on chat. Um, yes. Uh, thank you very much uh, uh, for being here with us. Thank you very much, to Torbjorn, for, jo for joining. Oh, wait. There's a thank final you. question. I think we can answer that one, too. Adita wants to know, uh, what are the main research areas in F1 aerodynamics? And do they invest on meshing techniques like in-house CFD codes? Yes, for sure. I mean, they, they, I think that there's a good mix. Uh, some teams use commercial software, but uh, typically they have good relations with the vendors and maybe they have special versions of certain things. Uh, they, they certainly develop their own tools, uh, for sure. Uh, they, they do a lot of things, you know, in terms of optimization and so on. So, so they, they, they are quite advanced uh, in, in that respect. And, and the bigger teams have their own, say, uh, methodology developers. Because at the end of the day, well, they need to be, be very fast. They would like to do a lot of design iterations in time. So they have to have very efficient processes. Uh, they create a lot of data. They need to understand how to rank the data, uh, to extract the, the correct information from the data. Because you basically you create teraflops of, of or terabytes or terabytes of data each week, and, and you need to understand what to extract. So, so, so they work on, on methods to extract, you know, to create, say, meta models and so on, uh, to extract what is important, uh, and based on that, you know, optimize the cars. So there is a lot of in-house methodology going on at the bigger teams. Yes. All right. Thanks uh, for for answering the question, Torbjorn. And now I think, um, okay, oh, well, this is really, guys, this is really the last question, okay, because that's usually what's happening whenever I want to close the session, someone comes up with a question, however, there's a question by Carlson, and he says, we don't have the resources to make a full aero package for our former student car, but we are considering diffusers, both on the side puts and maybe rear. Would you say this is worth doing? <coughs> I'm... I'm not really the expert on Formula student cars, I have to admit. I know too little about them uh, in terms of regulation and so on. Uh, if I were to guess, uh, I'm not sure how much of, of performance you can get from the floor of, of, because of the low speed and, 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 and so on. And, and um, uh, I'm not sure how much performance you can get from, from putting diffusers on, on the side pods. Uh, but but as I said, I, I know too little. Uh, just by looking at the cars, I see they have massive wings, massive front and rear wings. Uh, and with that massive front wing, uh, very close to the ground, um, I mean, that's good. It creates a lot of front damps, but I think it could be uh, create some issues for the floor to get the proper floor conditions coming to the floor. So it, uh, I cannot really answer that question. <laughs> All right, okay. Uh, yeah, then, now for the, for the last and final time, Torbjörn, thank you very much, guys, thank you very much also for joining, and we will see each other next week for the final session. Have a great evening. Bye. Right, thanks a lot.